So we're just waiting for Colin who uh, should be. Is he going to sit here? Um, Hi. Where's Colin? Yeah. He could. He's the chair. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. A, that's a great idea. So when did you introduce our friends that are presenting? Yes. Oh, so we have two visitors, um, Ginevra and uh, Naima, you know, who are visiting uh, from a few kilometers away. Hey, and we have two visitors from Paris, an artist and architect who have been following Colin's presentation for this. Okay, so maybe while we wait for Colin, I'll tell you a little bit about what we did. So it was a creative writing workshop, and we worked on two things. You know, the first was writing exercises, and we talked a lot about how one of the things that writers have to do is change perspective all the time. So try to imagine different situations from different points of view. Um, so one of those exercises, um, Morgan and Colin are going to lead, it was just based on, it was very simple. I said, you know, take something that's happened, you know, it doesn't have to be very dramatic, in here, in the Certosa where we were staying, and then try to tell it from different points of view. Um, so they chose an episode, actually, this was Morgan's idea, of something that you all know, which is when we meet in the afternoon and we have drinks, you know, in, in the bar. Uh, Morgan said, you know, it was interesting to think of what happens in those interactions. You know, what's the point of view of the Italian bartender? What's the point of view of like the people who come to get served? Uh, depending on whether they're Americans. You know, we had so many nationalities that come to stay here. So that's like a very good material, you know, for a creative writing exercise. Uh, so what we're going to start with is actually one of those exercises. And it's basically what Morgan and Colin wrote, just trying to imagine that. You know, typical night when someone gets drinks, but obviously elaborated in a slightly um, fictional way, and then written from two perspectives. Um, so Morgan chose the perspective of the bartender, and then Colin chose the perspective of one of the uh, visitors, you know, who was German, you know, this German man. And then something happens, you know, something goes wrong, and then each one of them tells a story from their point. The other thing that we were working on was their stories, and this was a completely free exercise. You know, each of them chose a topic and the um, story they wanted to write, and then they worked on it over the past uh, two weeks. And then it grew, it became you know, more elaborate, and then we edited down um, to maybe a story that's about four or five pages for each of them. And you heard a little bit um, when we did the midterm project. So yeah, I think you got a sense of what they're writing about. So let's start with the writing exercise, you know, which is about the uh, bartender and the place where we get drinks. And like I said, it's an imagined situation, but try to see what they've done with the point of view. So why don't we start with Morgan, who's writing from the point of view of the bartender. And by the way, this was an epistolary exercise. So it's meant to be a letter that the character is writing to a friend, you know, describing what happened. Dear Lorenzo, work has been very he hectic. I dropped a decanter on my way to the bar. I didn't spill a lot, only a little water, but the calamity was a bit embarrassing. I rushed over because people were already filling up in the courtyard, the meat and cheese place placed in their positions. They usually disappear within 10 minutes. I never restock it. Most of the time it's dedicated to work. Although my shift is late, it can, tr can transform in some of the hardest tasks. You would ask me what it's like to work around people in all different kinds that I meet, and honestly, I stop paying attention. I no longer ask people where they are, where they're from. I no longer ask other Italians what part of Italy they're from. But most of the time, there is a language barrier. What I like to do is count how many times a person can order the same drink. It passes the time quickly. Otherwise, if nobody is around, I watch videos on my phone. What I've described is not intense, but I can assure you the interaction with people from around the world is exhausting, and serving tourists is a fruitless endeavor. Previously, there was the night of free drinks. I met this man after that, and he ordered a beer. I didn't understand him at first. He was just mumbling until I handed him the beer, and he nodded. In anger, very clear this time, he said thank you, and grabbed his drink and turned to leave. I said five euro, and he turned around and raised his eyebrows. Five euro. I enunciated my syllable. Then he spoke in what I thought was a language of broken glass and throat clearing. Very abrupt, very silent. I held up the sign for him and pointed at the beer, 
follow the line to the other side of the page that had the price of bed gear and repeat it again, five euro. He walked over to me this time and placed his wrist on the bar. He spoke clearly, the same way I broke up my sentence as if the emphasis of each syllable was miraculously making me understand what he was about. To my luck, though, he took out his wallet and retrieved a bill of five euro, and I held my hand up to receive it. I stared at him, pointing, putting my hand out further so he could put it in my palm. He refused to give it to me. He spoke his sentence again, slower this time. I thought his words were slowly decapitating me. I didn't know whether to just let him go with it and then have him keep coming back for a few drinks when I wasn't there, and then encounter less passive bartenders. We stared at each other while I, while I reached out and grabbed the bill again, and he drew his hand back so I couldn't reach it. I slammed my hand down, and he began making hand gestures to communicate. He took out his phone then and showed me the calendar and pointed to the 5th of August, picked up his beer, and pretended to walk away. Understanding, I kindly said, no. No is universal, right? Which you promptly responded with, a borrow. It's just amazing to see how people are unwilling to cooperate. I didn't know how to answer him, so I just didn't. He actually walked away this time. I felt so much anger inside of me, I must have blacked out because when I opened my eyes, there was broken glass and beer spilled all over the floor, the other side of the, uh, the, other side of the bar. There was an officer there too, speaking to the man and my manager. Anyway, I'm writing this letter to you because I wanted to tell you a story of how I lost my job and how I can't afford to pay my phone bill and I no longer have a place to live. I know it's been a few years since we were in contact, but it would mean a lot to me if I could perhaps sleep on your sofa until I get back on my feet. Your dearest friend, Alexandra. <laughs> I mean, Colin, you read us the other one. Do you want me to read the, from the, the other guy's perspective? Yeah. That one? Or? Yeah. Okay. This is from the perspective, pers perspective of the German guy who had not given name. I was staying in a monastery in Tuscany, and my first night there I found they had an open bar. The drink was pretty good, and I decided to invite some friends back the following night. That night, when I ordered around for the table and started to leave, the, bar the bartender shouted something after me in Italian. I looked back for a minute, but having no idea what he had said, I merely continued on my way. But then he yelled at me again, this time with a very rude tone, and I looked back again confused. What was he going on about? He gestured toward the register and then back to me, and I thought to myself, is he actually trying to charge me for drinks at an open bar? I was fairly sure this was the same bartender from the other night, but now he was trying to swindle me. Did he think I would somehow forget that he had served me a free drink just the other night? I told him that I knew this was an open bar, but he seemed not to understand me, or else was simply pretending. Disgusted by this behavior, I turned once again to leave, but unbelievably, the man actually ran forward and physically blocked my way. I was so stunned that I stumbled right into him and spilled my drinks. The nerve of this man, trying to charge me for, for free drinks and then physically assaulting me when I wouldn't play his little game? I decided right then, that's it, I'm not dealing with this guy any longer. I dropped the tray of ruined drinks at his feet and pushed past him, ready to find his superior and let them know of this man's appalling behavior. <laughs> Okay, and now uh, Morgan and Colleen are going to read their short stories, uh, so they're about four pages each, and Morgan, do you want to say a few words about it before you start? Um, so it's a short story, I told you guys the plot of it before, it's just about this woman going to the Basilica of Santa Croce and taking a tab of acid in front of Dante Alighieri's grave. And I came up with the plot um, usually when I write, I hear names in my head, and I make the story based on the name that I thought of. And I didn't want to create something that had a, like a huge meaning, because I don't think that everything has to have a meaning. And um, I like to write based on what I'm feeling, and I love to write um, for comedy, whether it's poems, whether it's scripts, or whether it's short stories. And this is actually my one of my first time writing prose in a really, really, really long time. So. Oh, and let me just say, so the other day we had a friend who came and Morgan was explaining her story. And this, an Italian friend, you know, who is a writer, uh, she didn't know that there's a confusion about Dante's tomb. Because if, you, if you've been to Santa Croce in Florence, you know, there's what looks like a tomb. You know, it says Dante Alighieri, but it's actually empty because he was exiled and he's buried in Ravenna. But actually, a lot of people don't know that there's this empty tomb. It's actually um, a more of a memorial, you know, to Dante. 
And it's very interesting because it was put there only about 100 years ago, in 1829, and it was part of Italian nationalism, you know, the uh, efforts to unify Italy. Um, 18 or 19? 18, 18. 200, 200 already, huh? <laughs> <laughs> And so I titled it Dante's Allegory as like wordplay with like his last name, Dante Alighieri, and then that his whole, the whole divine comedy is an allegory for his, him being exiled from Florence. And, okay. Um, she had the eloquence of a howling monkey descending upon a yurt of a resting child at 6 a.m. The life she lived was simple, opening books, placing them down to fetch a cup of tea, and forgetting about the open pages on her nightstand while becoming distracted by her hot leaves and computer. Elias was a woman of many charms, from her thick curls draping her shoulders to her soft, powerful tongue, held limply in any situation that required her to hold something with a handle. Except the handleless glass, a thrush mending it on a brand new excavation site her companion had discovered. He called her only a, a woman, only a rich man could love. She had been inspired by watching documentaries in grade school about different sites that held remains of dinosaurs. She held a faint disdain for animals and dreamt of holding a human skull in the palm of her hand. This would be a huge red flag for some, but nonetheless, her parents were very supportive and brought her books on, on the study of human bones. Now people change, of course, and while being, very, being a very dull lady, she had the tendency to participate in hallucinatory activities to further her education in the spirit of said bones and connect deeply with the presence of her spirit. Most of her endeavors, whether professionally or for pleasure, result in a bodacious judgment that she insists only God himself can give her, whoever that may be. She decided to take a trip to Florence, Italy to connect with the greatness of architecture, as she recalled to her friends in the business world. They usually nodded in agreement out of pure ignorance. This week, she was taking holiday with a fellow colleague, a Mr. Brown. He had taken the train with her into Florence from Tuscany. Unbeknownst to him, she had a special plan. Mr. Brown had begun working at Elias's collective as an intern and had taken a fancy to her work as he was impressed by her bravado. One would explain why they keep her around and well, the answer is shocking. She is surprisingly very good at doing paperwork, especially the paperwork nobody else wants to do. Several senior members had tried to warn him of her antics, but he was smitten and young and viewed the world through rose, um, the lenses of rose gold. Her intention this blistering afternoon was to visit the Basilica of Santa Croce. Mr. Brown was amazed at the lack of gold and the art Catholics used to claim divinity, that the heavens value earthly riches and argued that this was a form of human arrogance. Elias brushed him off, ignored the lecture, and proceeded toward the tomb while placing something in her mouth that Mr. Brown can only assume was gum. She told Mr. Brown to explore, if he would like, and that she would look at Dante Alighieri's tomb. Assuming that was the Italian pronunciation, he nodded at her brilliance and continued to the lectern to take pictures and light a candle for one euro. The process of her levitation was an interesting one as her pupils began to dance, signaling to, to one another how they would initiate her visions. A smile crept onto her face as if a diabolical plan was in effect. She stood there like a statue, as thick as the marble in front of her. Taurus moved around her respectfully, resisting touch as if she were an exhibit. She placed herself rudely in front of the tomb obstructing photographs. She moved her limbs as if one of them had broken, rapidly flailing and talking as if we were in her head, perhaps. We could see what exactly she was dancing to or running from. And it switches perspective <laughs> to her. Dante looked down on me in church without knowing I looked down on him in his tomb. She placed her head on the pages of the book, a bow, a penance for the affluence of his words. The marble, a delicate gelatin bubbling back with a touch and becoming concrete once again. It was smooth, taking a butter knife and slathering the icing over the words that told me of his poetic. Transforming the letters into Roman numerals, I stumbled on his mind. His head turned to me with the sound of a hiss. His nose was not as I remember. Retreating into his skull, I released myself from my shell and grabbed a hold of him. Sucked into the vortex with several layers of blue and purple granite, scraping my nails along the outer edges of the world, he told me that God gave him the story that he wrote and bestowed me with the knowledge of his heart. I used the knife to carve my own words of honor, to honor the most honorable poet. He entrusted his honor into the tips of my fingers and into the palms, forearms, 
biceps, shoulders, neck, eyes, skull, and brain, traveling through my eyes like a colony of ants retreating from the sun. <coughs> and in the seventh century of birth, I encountered a school of men in the vineyards of Italy and saved myself so that I could travel in time. After witnessing the three-tiered hierarchy of the complete cake of Dante, I felt like, perhaps, Dante would part his words to speak to me about what he needed and he did. Obstructing his long, flat nose, his burnt skin tore, his white hair, his skin tore me. I found myself in a dark wood, overturned by the moonlight. I cast a shadow on the tree. The wind beneath my body has been suctioned back into the sky and leaves lay dead, beaten by the single light in a dark forest. But it was the silence of anticipation. The ground vibrated and the sky boomed with the hollowed out hole of a voice that simply said, girl. The leaves stirred once again. My parents hail from Florence. Although they hold no records large enough for me to testify, I was born into the conflict between the Ghibellines and the Guelphs. In this time, I had believed that nothing was more important than to be a part of a city state. and preached what Latini had taught me. In the political years of my late age, I was a part of the new embassy in San Gimignano against, my new, against the new Pope Boniface VIII. Following my exile, as I grew to resent pa papal law, I had written the Divine Comedy with Beatrice as my intercessor. Although I swore to never write her name after her death, I suppose, after the allegory of my journey, I am to be your guide, <laughs> your guide in death as Virgil and Beatrice were mine. His words struck me in the stomach and head, a purposeful message to inspire on a long journey. I was terrified. What does it mean, I cried. He bent my eyes, an inky black ball carried by exhaustion. I could hear angelic voices start to sing. The choir laced my eardrums and brought me to tears. We were not near heaven, and yet heaven had kissed my ears. And quite simply and very clear, Dante's voice did not break the voices, but had pushed them back farther amongst the trees and said nothing. I will tell you why I came and why I pity you, and I wish to help you, but I must in person retrieve me. And awaiting further instructions, I had entered a gloom from which I was ready to endure, channeling the muses of the sky I bargained up for the penance of mercy. They told me to dance beneath the rings of Saturn, beckoning me astray from Virgil and closer to Dante. I am sentient. Now from the outsider's perspective, we can infer that it was not in fact gum that Elias had put in her mouth. She has fallen to her knees in the Basilica of Santa Croce, and from the tourists that strolled about assumed she was just an avid Catholic or a devout fan. Mr. Brown strolling about with a wild smile, just absolutely gleaming with excitement, until he heard a loud bang. This was very rattling in a historical Italian church with tiptoeing tourists admiring the magnificence of the Renaissance. Anyone in their right mind would be startled, so it seems that everyone stopped to turn their heads in unison. Mr. Brown could have reacted in two ways, based on the information given to him by his colleagues. He could have went to investigate the bank to make sure Elias was not involved or there was no impending threat. Or he could have looked up from the plaque he was investigating to show the slightest interest in his surroundings. Luckily, his delayed reaction synced up with the reaction of the second bang. Startled gasps, mothers clutching, clutching their children and rushing for the exit. Out of pure curiosity and of no concern for Elias, Mr. Brown walked toward the commotion simply to document as his first and last step of becoming a journalist. The fury behind the banging was more evident the closer Mr. Brown squeezed his way through the startled crowd, gathered like gossiping chickens. They made no move to evacuate or even run when actually faced with the source of the chaos. Mild confusion replaced pandemonium and urgency and Brown's footsteps quickened at the sight of Elias' wild hair shaking all about as she, as she smashed the ground in the sand, with the sand repeatedly. Elias, Brown shouted. Dante? <laughs> Elias shuddered in her movements while striking the marble with so much force that the sand bounced off of it. Tell me, tell me, please, I'm here. Elias spun around with the velocity of a tornado and looked Brown in the eyes, pupils the size of coins in her small sockets. She released the sand and pushed the hair out of her eyes. In the distance, multiple footsteps, like a drum line, approached with rapid speed. Dante, Elias croaked. Brown shook his head, no. He watched Elias run her fingers through her hair repeatedly, obsessively, looking around with a shadow thought process. I freed him, she whispered and fell to her knees. The footsteps grew louder, almost hot with the persistence of a volcano. Elias, Brown shook his head again, confused. 
he had not come to the conclusion that perhaps the state of her pupils was violently unnatural. What do you mean you freed Dante? He wanted me to free him from his tomb. I freed him. She stood tall, gesturing to the floor around her as the marble had crumpled around her feet with each blow to the floor. He's free. Brown looked around her, still perplexed. But Dante isn't buried here. His body's in Ravenna. Elias furrowed her eyebrows as if she's seen for the first time and she can't quite make out Brown's face. She looked down at the floor, confused. Maybe the high was starting to wear off. Before she could come to her own conclusion, she was tackled and thrown to the floor. Brown did not flinch a finger in response to her current jailing. He told me to, she cried. Why? People parted ways for her escort. To tell me something. Well, what did he say? Elias obliged the officers and didn't put up a fight. She was not in shock. It seemed that this was a predicament like this. She was in a predicament like this quite often, but never something so stimulus as this one. He said, she croaked as her high was receding, that I'm a bad archaeologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the next Colin. Um, do you want to say a few words about your story? Uh, not sure. Heard your, not heard your, your, um, well, no, I'm kind of <laughs> um, So, my piece is called Elsewhere, and I had this idea for sort of like a combination of castaway, land of the lost, just a story of someone who ends up in a very strange place and is trying to find their way back to the world they knew. My eyes snapped open and was strange. <laughs> My eyes snapped open and with a strangled gasp I sat bolt upright. My chest heaved with ragged breaths as if I hadn't taken a breath for hours. A dark haze obscured my vision and for a second I panicked, thinking I had somehow gone blind. But no, thankfully, a pinprick of grayish light trickled through the shroud, and I slowly felt my sight returning. For a while, I simply sat there, sucking in deep breaths of salty air and waiting for my body to adjust from this state of unconsciousness. The fog receded, and gradually, my, sur my surroundings swam into focus. I lay on the very edge of a grayish beach with a massive cove ahead of me. The sea was a dark, inky blue, and the orange glow of the distant sunset cast a pale shimmer on the still water. A dense forest sprawled out behind me and curved all the way around the cove, right up to the sheer cliffs that flanked the entrance. The sand on which I sat was rough and gravelly, and looking down, I saw that, rather than sand, the beach was composed of bits of shell and fossil. Furious, I dipped my hand into the debris and let the loose particles trickle between my fingers like a sieve. Bringing my hand closer, I examined what remained and found a gleaming chart of abalone shell, several bits of bone, and, bizarrely, an entire trilobite. I furrowed my brow in confusion, and a sharp pain shot through my forehead. Wincing, I gingerly touched my crown and felt a large welt above my right eye. When I removed my hand, my fingers were slick with blood. Ouch, I muttered to myself and jumped at the sound of my own voice. I had been so focused on my strange surroundings that I hadn't even noticed how unnaturally quiet everything was. True, the sounds of distant bird calls could be heard from the trees behind me, and the occasional breeze did elicit a faint whisper from the rustling foliage, but the sounds seemed muted and somehow hollow. Then I noticed a detail that made my gut lurch. There was something wrong with the cove. The inky water was completely and utterly silent, no sounds of spraying surf or crashing waves. The cove wasn't just still, it was unnaturally still, like a clear sheet of glass reflecting its surroundings like a mirror. No waves stirred the depths, no breeze disturbed the surface. My breathing became shallow, my heart hammered against my ribcage. For reasons I couldn't explain, the unnatural stillness and silence of the water was driving me into a panic. It was as if my mind couldn't process the idea, as if my body were physically rejecting what it was seeing. I felt as if I were moments away from blacking out, and I squeezed my eyes shut, driving the code from my mind. I immediately felt myself relax. Apparently, I had subconsciously been clenching damn near every muscle in my body. Eyes still shut tight, I shook my head in confusion and embarrassment. What the hell is wrong with you? I scolded myself aloud. It's water, for God's sake. Once I caught my breath, I squinted one eye open a crack to peek at the unnaturally still water. Nothing seemed to happen, and I cautiously opened my other eye to look, intrigued. I lasted about half a minute before a wave of fear and nausea washed over me again. I immediately lowered my gaze and focused on the fossilized beach and said, Oh, shit. My voice quavered. Okay. Okay, don't stare at the water. Got it. I had no idea why the water was so unnaturally still or why its presence seemed to freak me out so much, but I had other questions to answer. What was going on? Where was I? How had I gotten there? These questions and more swirled around my head as I gazed blearily at my unfamiliar surroundings. 
I furrowed my brow, wincing again, apparently having already forgotten about my head injury, and tried to sort through my scattered thoughts. Okay, what did I know? Well, for starters, I knew my name was Ian, although that hardly seemed to matter right then. I also knew that I'd never even been to the ocean before and couldn't recall how I had ended up on the edge of one, alone and unconscious. I thought harder, searching my memories for clues. I had been on some sort of boat, or maybe a plane? I remembered a loud noise and then screaming? My eyes widened as it all came flooding back to me, and I felt my blood turn to ice. Charlotte, I gasped, scrambling to my feet. My honeymoon, our honeymoon, our cruise, where was she? I frantically scanned the beach for signs of life, my breathing shallow, trying not to panic again. There had been some sort of accident on the ship, an explosion. I don't think it had been too damaging, but we'd both been right near it when it happened. I had been thrown overboard, but Charlotte, had she been? Charlotte, I bellowed, my voice echoing faintly across the silent water. I waited anxiously, praying to hear her call out to me, but I heard nothing. Again, I called to her, yelling at the top of my lungs over and over, but in my gut, I knew she wouldn't answer. I was completely alone on this damned island. Nobody knew I was here, and the love of my life was... Suddenly, I gasped as I noticed a crumpled mass far off the left side of the cove. How hadn't I noticed it before? I half ran, half stumbled towards the shape, hoping against hope that if it was her, she wasn't... No, I panted. Of course she's alive. Don't think like that. My shallow attempts to reassure myself did nothing to help unclench the knot in my stomach. As I made my way across the beach, however, it became obvious that the shape wasn't human or even organic. It appeared to be some sort of machinery, a chunk of metal about the size of a washing machine, partially buried in the fossilized detritus that littered the beach. I assumed it must be part of the cruise ship that had washed ashore along with myself and quickened my pace. As I drew level with the conscript, however, my anxiety was momentarily replaced by curiosity. Whatever this thing was, it looked technologically advanced, but at the same time, ancient. The design of the machine was certainly sophisticated, with precisely cut metal plating and a multitude of gauges used to measure I didn't know what. Yet thick layers of rust and creeping vegetation encrusted its surface and gave the otherwise futuristic device the appearance of a worn-out relic. I gently began scraping bits of lichen off the top of the construct, and at my touch, a low hum began to emanate from inside it. My first thought was, bomb, and with a yelp, I scrambled backward as fast as I could. Before I'd even gotten a few meters away, I heard the device powering back down again, and noticed faint lights that had flickered on within the gauges fade back into darkness. I stood frozen for a minute or so, staring at the strange device, an internal battle between common sense and curiosity raging within me. My common sense argued that this thing, whatever it was, clearly wasn't Charlotte, and that it could very well be dangerous. My curiosity, on the other hand, suggested that since this was the first sign of human life I'd seen on this bizarre island, it was probably worth investigating. Swallowing, I tentatively crept back towards the device. As I grew nearer, I heard that low humming begin again, softly at first, and gaining volume the closer I got. It didn't seem dangerous, merely reacting to my presence, though how in the hell this rust-covered relic half buried in dusty seashells could possibly still function was beyond me. Several faded multicolored lights flickered and pulsed in synchrony as I drew nearer, reminiscent of a tiny electronic heartbeat, exactly like a heartbeat. I paused just within touching, touching distance of the device as an absurd idea struck me. Pressing a hand to my chest, I focused on the rhythm of the blinking lights, feeling my heart steadily beating beneath my palm. My eyes grew wide as I realized the lights were flashing in time with my own pulse. This machine, whatever it was, could sense me. Or maybe, somehow, my pulse was actually powering this thing? Feelings of excitement and wonder exploded in my mind, and the flashing of the lights sped up to echo my own quickening heartbeat, seeming to validate my theory. I couldn't help but smile at my discovery, though my situation hadn't actually improved much. This machine, whatever it was, seemed to only operate when someone was in close enough proximity, which explained why it hadn't previously shown any signs of functionality. I was the only living thing in sight. I took a moment to marvel at the baffling nature of this mysterious place. This beach of decay, the cove of unnatural silence, no signs of human life but for this inexplicable contraption. I felt terrified, but at the same time exhilarated. I sought to leave this place as soon as possible, and yet felt a curious urge to explore every aspect of it. I wanted to discern where I was, not just so that I could leave, but so I could understand this place. I had always been a sucker for puzzles, and examining this machine was tickling the same part of my brain that thrilled at solving a riddle or cracking the code. And that thought gave me hope. If this machine, if this place was like a puzzle, then it could be solved, and I was very good at puzzles. With a newfound sense of purpose, I set about examining the humming contraption in more detail. As I scraped off dried strands of seaweed from the rusted plating, I noticed intricate patterns etched into the framework. Most of the designs resembled circuit boards, but scattered around the edges I found tiny symbols that resembled runes and hieroglyphics. While this did nothing to help decipher this machine's purpose or origin, it certainly piqued my interest and got the cogs in my head turning. Pulse-powered technology, 
or in advance of anything we've got back home, but it looks like it's been here for centuries. I was muttering to myself, a habit of mine that Charlotte had always found slightly amusing. At her memory, I lost my train of thought and shook my head to clear it. Focus. It's advanced, but it's ancient. Circuit boards mixed with weird symbols. When was this thing even made? I examined the multicolored lights, their pulsing still in time with my own, but found nothing to give me any clues. The gauges were similarly perplexing. Each one had incremental markings across their edges, clearly intended to measure something, but nothing seemed to hint at precisely what. I turned my attention back to the engraved markings that covered the surface, absent-mindedly tracing the circuit board pattern with my fingers. I was barely paying attention to where the line was taking my hand, and blinked in confusion when I felt the deep grooves of the circuit board give way to clear, smooth metal. I glanced down to where my fingers had stopped, and saw that the intricate patterns all seemed to converge in the center of the side panel nearest to me, encircling a bare ring of metal and fanning out from its center like a sunburst. I narrowed my eyes suspiciously at this detail. Surely there was some significance to this design choice. I pondered this for a while and watched the lights in the machine brighten and dim along with me. Was it a button? On an impulse, I pressed my thumb to the metal ring and held it there, as one would a fingerprint scanner. I felt as if the humming of the machine slightly increased in volume, though that may have just been because I was touching it near the source of the hum. I considered the ring again, studying the pattern more closely. This time, I noticed a second concentric ring around the first, less obvious because it was composed of small points worked into the engraved lines. There were five points in total, spread out like a fan above the center ring, evenly spaced, except for the rightmost point, which was slightly lower than the rest. Oh! I exclaimed. In a flash, it had come to me, now painfully obvious in hindsight. I spread the fingers of my left hand and pressed my palm to the center ring. Each of my fingertips lined up perfectly with the upper four points, while my thumb aligned with the lower fifth. Immediately, I felt the humming intensify, felt the vibrations of the machine travel down my fingertips and up my arm. A pale light began to spread from my points of contact along the lines, traveling outwards from the center and navigating the erratic geometry of the engraved pattern. Soon the entire construct emitted a faint fluorescent glow, giving the machine the appearance of an ornately carved mystic totem. Without warning, the loose gravel beneath my feet shifted. My hand slipped from its position, but the machine didn't seem to need it there anymore. I stepped back cautiously, watching the shells and bones near the base of the machine rattle and dance as the vibrations increased. Suddenly, dozens of dazzling beams of light shot out from the top of the machine, spearing off in every direction like bolts of white-hot electricity. The beams were all different sizes and to varying degrees of intensity. Most were slim and faint, but a few were far brighter and considerably larger. The vast crisscrossing network of lights resembled an ethereal spider's web, like strands of silk stretching impossibly far into the distance. I noticed that one of the smaller beams had come to rest only a few meters away, right where the forest met the edge of the fossilized beach. Heart racing, I jogged over to the, where the faint light shone, my footfalls crunching on the brittle fragments of ancient life that shattered beneath my feet. Crouching low, I squinted at the place where the light fell. Oddly, the beam didn't seem to provide any light to its surroundings, as if the brightness were contained exclusively within itself. It was difficult to see using only the orange glow of dusk, but it was, I was certain I could make out a rough, small shape beneath the glare of the beam. Reaching out to touch it, I felt the now familiar brush of rusted metal, and realized it was likely a device similar to the one on the beach. This one, too, was hampered by encroaching terrain, and I had to work hard to pry it from the ground. With one last heave, I wrenched the piece from the cold group of dirt, and instantly, the beam of light that had led me there flickered and died. I rolled back around to face the machine, the filthy block of metal cradled in my arms like an infant. I even worried that it had been deactivated, but no, the vast web of light still remained, bright and unwavering as before. This also indicated that whatever I had done by placing my hand against it had given it the, the ability to power itself. Only the beam that had pointed to the device that now rested in my hands had gone out. I traced the paths of several more beams. Many of the smaller ones dotted the beach between the machine and the far-off cliffside, but many, many more seemed to point directly into or even through the dense forest to my side. The light didn't seem to be hindered by obstacles and passed through the vegetation as if it weren't even there. A feeling of suspicion prompted me to examine the forest leaves, but no, they weren't holograms. The leaves and the trees were real, but the light simply ignored them, passing through as if they were ghosts, each pointing resolutely toward their own distant target. I glanced down at the crusty object I held and saw that it, like the larger machine, had rusted metal plating and was similarly adorned with circuit board etchings. And in that moment, I knew what this machine was and what I had to do, and the prospect filled me with both excitement and dread. It's a map, I said to myself. It's a map that shows where all these things are located. I still didn't have a clue what any of this meant, but I knew deep down that this was important, essential even. Somehow, some way, finding all these objects would help me get back to Charlotte. I had absolutely no proof to back that up and no real reason to believe it, and yet it stood as fact within my mind. I focused my attention on the largest, brightest beam of light that shone from the map, squinting from the glare, and carefully followed its trajectory. Up, up it went, 
shining bright as a star and straight as an arrow, and pierced the side of the cliff miles above the ground where I stood. In the dim glow of a perpetual dusk, I gasped as I made out the silhouette of a massive crumbling structure built directly into the face of the cliff. Modern in design, but derelict in appearance, the building had the look of a long-abandoned science laboratory. Rusted metal coils branched out from a central construct like roots, anchoring the structure securely to the rough stone, and the brightest beam of the map was leading me directly to it. I placed the device I pulled up on the ground gently next to the larger one, straightened up and brushed the dust from my legs. I had never gone mountain climbing before, but as I glared upward at the looming cliffside, I reminded myself that there was a first time for everything. I had the impression that there were a great many things I would experience for the first time on this godforsaken island. Don't worry, Charlotte, I muttered to myself as I marched resolutely toward the distant cliffs. I'll be with you again soon.